Thank you, Stuart. I'd, my presentation today follows on a theme that Andrew has introduced, which is about this concept of social licence. So I'm going to talk about wool in a competitive marketplace. I'm going to talk a lot about consumers, but I'm going to, in keeping with our uh, speech last year, we're going to focus on the far end of the supply chain. So we'll start at the very highest level. Wool is part of the global clothing business, particularly Australian wool. Consumers spend around a trillion US dollars a year on what they wear. If you add in footwear, you add about another 400 billion. Um, wool catches about 80 billion of that spend per year. Okay, so we get about 8% of the value share. But we're less than 2% of the volume. The enterprise, most of the money, most of that spend is on knitwear. So it's roughly 60-40 split and a little bit of non-wovens. And what trickles through to the growers, um, say here in Australia, we, we catch about 70% of all that global investment by consumers that trickles through to farmers. About 70% of it ends up here in Australia. Which is, so Australia still very much drives the global apparel industry. As, as Carolyn has mentioned, supply is tight and the growth prospects um, are quite low. So an interesting challenge for us long time, and particularly long term, and one that we take um, very seriously, is that for us, if supply is not going to grow, but our farmers in Australia want the price of wool to go up long term, one of the key things that we have to succeed at is driving up how much consumers spend to buy every kilogram of wool. Okay? Now, it's in that context I'm going to talk about social licence. Wool is a tiny part in a sea of other textile fibres. Um, Andrew just talk, talked about Australian cotton. Australian, by my reckoning, we're about 4% of the global supply. Australia's wool is about 0.4 of a percent of the global uh, fibre supply. What's happening, the projections here, and this is from PCI Fibres from their Red Book late last year, stretch out to about 2060. By 2060, you'll see that the dramatic change has been the massive increase in man-made fibre production. That's the uh, orange line in that overhead. Cotton production is growing, of course, particularly in places like China. But uh, look at what happens to wool. Even if our production levels stay at their present level, um, the wool's share of the market by 2060 will be at 0.2 of a percent. Australia's share, sorry. So we're obviously not a bulk commodity. Compared to the other bulk commodities, we've actually done pretty well since we got rid of the stockpile. This overhead shows the 21 micron wool price, sort of a bread and butter wool, compared to the Kotluk A index, acrylic and polyester prices. And I've just highlighted there when we got rid of the wool stockpile. And you can see that the trend has been really quite positive. That's in AU dollars. Over that period, the Australian currency doubled. So if I put up the trend in US dollars, it would be vastly more positive. And I want to talk about a little bit about upside, uh, a slightly different perspective to what Carolyn presented. And if we talk about the super fine end of the spectrum, some of the work we've done has been looking at other indicators or other correlates with particular micron bands. And I want to show you here the, how the global or global cotton, sorry, uh, cashmere price indicator relates to the price of superfine wool in Australia. As it turns out, even though they're largely produced in completely different continents, there's quite a, high, uh, quite a strong correlation between the two. Now, what's happening in the Kashmir game? Well, basically, it's pretty trendy with consumers. But the other thing that is happening, it's un the production is dropping, uh, particularly driven by demand for meat and particularly in places like China. So if we think about the outlook, particularly the finer end of the spectrum, there are, if you look overseas and look at some of our major competitors, or some of the people we'd like to take some market share from, the, the, the prospects are quite positive. 
As Carolyn put up, the, the price outlook for us we think is quite positive. Now we're not in the business of forecasting price, so all I've added here um, is the forecast from a London-based forecast that we, we pay a bit of attention to, as well as ABARES, which is called the Economic Intelligence Unit. Um, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but it's interesting that they, anyway, they think that the, the like ABARES, that the long-term prospects for the wool fibre are quite positive. Okay, and Carolyn, I'd like to update. I haven't, that's last year's data. Okay, that upward trend in US dollars is largely the emergence of China. So if we now start to talk about how the consumer markets change, now that I've set that high level landscape for you, for us, we've been looking very hard at the, the long term evolution or the likely pressures uh, demographically on consumers. The investments that we make now as a research and development corporation pay out over decades. So we are very, we're looking hard at where the market's going. Some fascinating work that we had done by a guy called Clint Laurent looks at demographic change over the next decade in the global markets. Now he segments the expenditure, he came up with five segments and they're the vertical uh, bars based on how much consumers spend per capita on clothing and footwear. You can see the top uh, group, they spend more than, each person spends more than 1200 US dollars a year on clothing and footwear. Well that represents 38% of global spend on clothing but it's only 5% of the people around the world. It's an extraordinary concentration of, spe of spend on clothing and footwear. It's basically a function of the fact that the vast majority of the world's population live in the third world and do not spend a lot of money on clothing. If you add the next category, that's adding another 3% of the consumers, we take it up to 50% of the spend on clothing. Now wool is an expensive discretionary purchase. It's around at the moment about seven times the cost of cotton. So one of our challenges is which part of this market do we want to play in? Who can afford to buy wool? In the future, which consumers will be able to afford to buy wool? It's interesting also that those to top two categories are the most rapidly growing categories in terms of their share. Going a step further, now let's look at our traditional markets and some of the new markets. And just as Carolyn's presentation was a tale of two fibres, in a sense cotton versus wool and the different drivers, the wool industry's prospects are very much a tale of the old world and the new world. This overhead shows the projected growth in spend on clothing and footwear on that x-axis, the bottom axis, over the next 10 years. The y-axis shows how much of that growth is going to be captured by those top two categories, the wealthy, the people that spend more than 900 US dollars a year on what they wear. So if you look at, for example, the old world, here are our traditional markets. If you look at what the average annual rate of growth in consumer spend on clothing will be in those markets over the next 10 years, as forecast, it's about 1% per annum. Some of the markets, some of our traditional top 10, are forecast to decline. Places like Spain have a negative population growth. One of our big challenges in the next decade is Japan. But by comparison, if you look at the emerging powerhouses, the, the so-called BRICS, and by the way, the size of the symbol, the size of the circle is the projected spend by consumers on clothing in 2021. And you notice that the Chinese market is forecast to be as big as the US market. The BRIC nations are forecast to grow at about 5% per annum over the next decade. These are increasingly important for us. Now, I've mentioned the luxury end of things or consumers who are spending a lot of money. The, the luxury apparel seg segment of the market is the fastest growing segment of the, the business. So it's been growing at around nine or so percent per annum. In this area, provenance or the story of the, the fibre, the authenticity is very, very important. And also consumers pay 
for they pay a premium to be guaranteed a good quality outcome. And as I'll, talk, I'll mention in a minute, that, that also relates to environmental and ethical outcomes. But the key point is the one at the bottom. If you have any doubts about the emergence of Asia in driving uh, industry, uh, particularly ours, the Chinese consumers are absolutely driving the global luxury market. The most telling statistic is the, the bottom bullet point. One third of all the luxury item purchases in the European Union are by Chinese tourists. It's extraordinary. They are the second largest consumers of luxury items. So for us as an industry, for AWI as a R&D company, for Woolmark in the marketing, these are some very important strategic observations in terms of where our consumers will be and what part of the market they occupy. But it's not just wealth. With wealth also comes the ability to be moralistic about your fibre choices because you can afford to, d to be discretionary about whether you buy, let's say, um, a fibre that you think is ethically better or drive a hybrid Lexus. And Porsche releasing hybrids now. A couple of years ago, we had a company called Publicis Europe do a study for us on the mega trends that are affecting fibres and fibre choices. And the one of the things that they strongly uh, concluded was it's this desire to lead a, a lifestyle of health and sustainability is an absolute mega trend, and it affects fo food, fiber, transport choices, etc. A full seven of the 14 individual trends they pointed out relate to your ability or preference for um, environmentally and ethically assured products. This is a, f a fundamental thing that's affecting wool, but it's also affecting cotton. Comes back to this social license issue that consumers are prepared to invest in. The wool industry is having to, re to react, to respond to these challenges, particularly from the, what you might call the, the fringe of that consumer mega trend, particularly non-governmental organizations who want to influence the retailers and uh, the supply chain. A classic example is Made By. Made By is just one of the many existing design tools that have come in. These are fibre rating tools. So they rate cotton, they rate polyester, acrylic. Various tools, as you can see from this symbol, go various ways through the supply chain. Some of them, uh, if this works, some of them go cradle to grave. Some only deal with on-farm. So a whole bunch of them like Maybuy, Ecometrics, Ecoindex. Life cycle analysis is a, key, is a key part of it. So how do Maybuy rate wool? Well, rate, Maybuy have five classes and a sixth for non-rating. Well, wool is rated in the worst possible rated category. Up here. Recycle wool's in the top. Cotton is up here. Okay. Things like uh, acrylic gets a better rating than wool on their eco-index. It's extraordinary. So part of our challenge has been to understand what they're doing, engage with them. So there are six component parameters, including land use efficiency. This is where cotton also falls down. In the, their measure of land use efficiency is kilograms per hectare. And they're comparing a synthetic factory with a farm. If we were to increase our productivity from our farms on a kilograms per hectare basis, what would happen to erosion, ground cover, etc.? So wool scores badly on a lot of parameters. Sheep produce a lot of methane. So they claim scouring is highly toxic. They claim that the, the chemicals that farmers use are highly toxic. It also needs a lot of land to produce a kilo. In our discussions with them, uh, we believe a lot of the data they've used is, is very poorly selected, non-representative and old. It was done by a US-based consultancy firm. So part of our challenge is to engage with these guys as an industry. That's part of our long-term earning a social license. But one of the challenges is this is going mainstream. So Maybuy's index became the Nike 
Materials Index, and it's now become the Sustainable Apparel in uh, Coalition's Higg Index. There are 60 leading brands involved in this, and if you look at some of those brands, you're, we're talking the biggest in the world. Adidas, you've got um, in, say, the, the hunting fishing set or quality clothing, Burberry. In the outdoor world, Patagonia, Levi's, Puma, the VF Corporation, Target. So these, for these guys are rating the textile fibres and these companies that have signed on, have signed on to, be, to use this information in their fibre choices. So wool scores very, very low. It's even worse than corn-fed leather. It's polyester scores much more highly, even though it's an oil-based fibre. So one of, this is a challenge for us. Greenpeace are in on the act. So Greenpeace launched their dirty laundry campaign uh, early last year. They've released two of the five reports. Their focus initially has been China. And they've been working very quietly for about four years monitoring effluent uh, discharges. Our expectation is at some point they'll, they'll do a report on wool. Um, they're focused mainly on cotton and the man-made fibres so far. They've identified 11 groups of chemicals that are used commonly in the global textile industry, including cotton, which they, they want phased out within, by 2020. There's a whole range of things from detergents to plasticizers, even dry cleaning fluids that you may have your suit you, uh, washed out or cleaned in at, a, at your local dry cleaner. So we've been looking hard at wool's exposure here. They've initially targeted 14 brands and they're focused on cotton and man-made fibres. Already five of the major brands and two of the retailers have signed on to zero discharge status for their supply chains by 2020. That's, what's that, eight years away, seven years away. And they're focusing first on the outdoor sector. So this is a real challenge for us and it affects all of the fibre industries, be it cotton or wool. The other thing that we are dealing with, and this is where I'd like to draw my presentation toward a finish, is demographic change. The demographics are affecting our fibre markets, our established markets in particular, and critically ageing. In UK, Japan, Germany, France and Italy, over 50 year olds will represent more than 50% of clothing spend by 2016. That's sort of the late baby boomers. As I look around the audience, there's a number of us, myself included, that are in this, well, I'll be in that category by 2016. In Japan, more than half the population will be over 50 by 2016. So this affects the sort of clothing market that we supply to and the sort of fibre choices or product segments that consumers want to buy. So a major trend is what we call affluent ageing, okay? The other end of the spectrum with declining birth rates but with rising middle class and wealth, there is the thing called the little emperors. These are parents who spend so much money on their children, lots of money to buy very little fabric. And the other thing for us, we're very excited by this market, is it's a high turnover market. So there are implications for us. So in our strategy, there's a fundamental concept which underpins a lot of what we do, which is about market defence, growth and creation. So the best quadrant for us to, to operate in is that top right-hand quadrant up here, where consumers are wearing their products every day and wearing them out, but you're getting a high retail price per year. The worst space for Australian growers to operate in is down here. So a lot of our traditional products fall in that space. They're winter products. They're heavy. They're made from coarse fibre. They last a long time in your wardrobe. Bedding is an all year round uh, proposition. The mass market's right in the middle, but you tend not to wear some of the things in hot weather, do you? Lightweight knits, and particularly the base layers, the, you will have seen the icebreaker products and so on. This is an important market for us. Socks, luxury suitings is an important market for us, high dollars per kilo. Now we are looking to develop, we've got an active program to develop new categories based on this logic. High dollars per kilo all year round. 
But in many of these categories, your social license is extremely important. If you think of the infants where the pressure on chemical residuals and natural non-irritant is extremely high. So our strategy is about defending the, the mainstream, growing this part and creating this new part of the market. Okay, the social license is very important for us. So to conclude, wool needs to be seen as a part of a lifestyle of health and sustainability. And AWI is working very hard to that end. Our challenge is to reinforce and communicate wool's wellness and sustainability credentials to brands, retailers and consumers. Another challenge that we have, just like cotton, is to work on our pipeline chemistry. Achieving success in all these areas is absolutely critical, particularly if you are a small, expensive, discretionary fibre choice like wool. Thank you.